everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of The Beat. I'm your host, Tristan Kumi, and today I'm with Professor Herman Surfacious. Um, thank you for your time. I appreciate you coming in today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Do you want to talk about a little bit what you do here at Worcester State? Uh, what I do here at Worcester State, so I'm a professor, uh, adjunct professor of communications mm -hmm. here. Uh, I teach media writing, public speaking. I'll be teaching digital storytelling next semester. That's and really I've dabbled in a couple other courses like Intro to Mass Communication and I've also taught English 101, College Writing 1, so I do a lot of a little bit, or of a little course. bit of a lot. Of course, so yeah, of course, of course. Will. Utility. Okay, so what is your background with music? With music, so um, so one of the things, I, I've been playing music since I was a kid, you know, violin, piano, and so forth. Um, uh, one of the things I'm doing currently is I sing in the Worcester course. I'm a, I'm a bass there, and we're actually going on tour to Spain this coming summer. So we'll be touring Barcelona for about 10 days and we're seeing part of a, of a bigger festival where choirs come around from all around the world to perform in that one city for about 10 days. Oh, wow. uh, so that's gonna be a fun time. I was actually coincident, this is purely by coincidence, but I was there last summer in that same festival with a different choir, which is kind of a very weird, random yeah. circumstance of fate right there. But, but yeah, that's one of the things I'm doing with music right now. More of a, on the amateur side of things, but I, but I still keep up with it. And I compose as well, so. No, that's, yeah, I've, I grew up as a musician as well, kind of self-taught, like guitar and all of that, so it's, it's cool to see. Um, have I heard anything from your choir or? Uh, I don't know if you've heard anything from the, the Worcester course specifically. We do a lot of concerts around Worcester. We perform in Mechanics Hall frequently. Mm -hmm. I have sung on a Grammy-winning album for one track, so I've done that. That's, that's cool. one of my 15 seconds of fame, if you will. So if you've heard Miho Journey to the Mountain by Paul Winter, he's a uh, jazz or new age musician. Uh, he won a Grammy for that album, and I'm on one of the tracks for that one so as a singer. So, uh, so again, I have, similar to what I was saying before about uh, you know trying things out, trying you know doing as much as you can, saying yes to projects. That's one of those things that just happened because I was in the right place at the right time, and it wasn't I wasn't trying to be a singer on an album for a jazz album, right? But you know the opportunity presented itself, so I tried it out, and it worked out. So that's know. how it goes. So again, so you might have heard that perhaps, but. Uh, uh, most, most things I do are more uh, live concerts. I, I haven't recorded too many things. I see, I see. Award winner. So that's, that's, yes. that's always a good thing to put they on the resume. They haven't sent me my Grammy sure. yet, so I'm still waiting. Oh, hey. Get him his Grammy, please. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting on it. Can you talk about the filmmaking part a little bit? Filmmaking part, for yeah. sure. So part of my, I'll talk about the, the, the documentary side of it first. So okay. part of my civic media degree was mostly, I focused on film. Civic media is, of course, a fairly broad term. Yeah. Right? So I focus more on the film side of things, and you could call it documentary production. Uh, so for that, I've, I've mainly been doing informational videos for various people that hire me, just uh, uh, independent contractor stuff and things like that. But lately, I've actually been dabbling more in uh, narrative filmmaking. So I'm currently working on a, a project called Periphery, which I'm actually co-directing and I co-wrote with another professor here, Brittany Severance. Uh, and we're actually hoping to release that in the coming years. So we're submitting to festivals, and that's currently where we're at with that project. So uh, even though I had thought that I would hopefully in an ideal world be in a place where I could work on one documentary production and one uh, narrative production every year in my lifetime if I was thinking about the ideal career. Mm. Uh, I've sort of gotten there a little earlier than I expected because uh, Brittany sort of pushed me in that narrative direction which is kind of nice. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's my, my area there with film is I try to do a little bit of both. A little bit of both, absolutely. It's one of my passions. So when you're making a film, what are like the biggest challenges that go into it? The biggest challenge, it depends yeah. on the film. So documentary is okay. probably, I would say personally, a little bit more challenging than narrative because you have a lot more control over, over narrative. Right, right. Um, specifically with my degree at Emerson Civic Media, we were, we were really focused on finding alternative ways to do common practices. So for example, with a documentary production, you might already have an idea of a story you want to go tell and then you go into a space and you document that space and the, you interview people. But with civic media, the concentration was very much to find alternative ways to do those kinds of things. So think of it more as going into a space and making yourself a tool for those people to use. So instead mm -hmm. of you going in and saying, I'm the director and I'm going to direct this project and tell this story, instead you go in and say, hey, I'm the expert. I know how to work the cameras and set up the interviews and right, tell right. the story, but you are going to direct me and tell the story, if you will. So it's a slightly different approach to other standard practices within documentary filmmaking. So that's the one side of it. So the challenges there are, of course, finding stories and then trying to be as unbiased as possible. As I'm sure you right. know, it's really hard to figure out what to put in, what to leave out. It's really hard to stay unbiased in that kind of a field. Um, but that's probably the biggest challenge is figuring biggest out what story to tell, what to keep in, what to keep out. But the same goes for narrative, of course. It's really hard to 
make those de decisions and choices of what story to tell, right? I know you mentioned that you do documentary production, um, and I understand you do digitizing on like the side. Yeah, it's one of my, my passions slash hobby. It's more of a side hustle than anything right now, mm. but it's also a hobby. One of my passions is telling other people's stories for them or helping them tell their right. stories, but also helping them remember their stories. And I think digitizing is sort of along that line of thinking where sometimes people have a lot of memories or things that they want to remember that they can't because they don't have the technology to view it anymore. So it could be a reel of eight millimeter film or it could be a photograph that's uh, too small for them to see or slides or things like that uh, or of that nature. And um, I think one of, the, one, one of the biggest passions I have is digitizing those things, showing them to people and then seeing the reaction because it's always fascinating to see what people do with that stuff. Right. Because it's never the same thing twice, which I always find, I, you would imagine you would get similar reactions over and over again, but everyone reacts differently to seeing uh, things that you digitize for them, whatever it may be. Sometimes it's an old memory they haven't seen in forever. Uh, maybe it's something they didn't even know existed in the first place, or maybe it's something they've been, um, you know, wanting to see for so long, and, but it's different than the, how they remember it. There's so many different ways people remember footage of various kinds. Uh, I, recently, I digitized uh, a wedding video for actually a student of mine, and um, I, had, I had just assumed that they had seen it plenty of times before and they wanted to rewatch it, but what had turned out to be the case was that uh, this was their, her parents' wedding, uh, and apparently someone had shot this footage on their wedding day and they had never looked at it since that day, wow. right? Because they just didn't have the means to. Uh, and I think that's just a fascinating backstory, right? Like the idea that you, know, you would have footage, maybe even want to see it, uh, and then 20, 30, 40 years later is the first time you're viewing that footage, which maybe isn't done intentionally, but again, digitizing helps create those, those stories and, bring them, and, and preserve them as well. That's mm. another big part of digitizing, right? And so it's one of the things I got into over the pandemic, actually, during uh, in 2019, 2020, around that time, because I had a lot of time on my hands. Right. Uh, and so I was digitizing stuff for various family members, and a lot of those stories came to the forefront, which I thought was interesting. And again, people's reactions to it. You'd be surprised how many times uh, people are very interested in something that you think is something you want to throw away. Maybe it's a blurry picture or a video that's out of focus, and you said, do you really want to save this? And they say, no, I really want that, because for whatever reason, there's a sentimental reason or, or whatnot and vice versa, you find a really good picture, or uh, maybe I did a lot of family tree and lineage work, right, and then you sometimes give that to people and they don't care at all. They're, they're just not something they care about. And so it's always fascinating to see what, what people do with that stuff, you know, with what you come up with there. No, absolutely. Like and it helps as a filmmaker, right? Yeah, you know, I can you're, you're seeing these stories and you're seeing how people react to certain things and react to memories and react to, uh, to how they think things used to be, right? And that gives you ideas for what you might want to write about or how you might write a character, for example. So again, all these things are sort of intertwined they, they, and yeah. interrelated. It seems know? like that. They're like puzzle pieces in a Absolutely, way. Absolutely, yes. You know, people seeing like their deceased family members or, or just something, right. like it could just be very random. I could imagine the, the, uh, the, the feelings on their faces and just being able to see that projected to your work is, is pretty cool. Going into applying to uh, film festivals or something like that, what, what goes into that? goes into film festivals, well obviously first thing is money, you have to spend your money wisely because you're going you're to be paying a little bit to get into those festivals. I think uh, the biggest thing is uh, not biting off too much, right? so making sure you know what your piece is, say it's a short film like the one I'm working on right now, you want to make sure you apply to festivals where it will actually be appreciated and viewed correctly. right? So again, sometimes I feel like people bite off more than they should and they, they apply to everything. They, they spend a lot of money doing so. Right. So instead, I think the biggest thing there is uh, to maybe uh, concentrate more on what we think would work best for your project, depending on what it is, of course. No, that, that makes sense for sure. Yes. So if you're, if you're talking to somebody that's new in the field, me personally, or a lot of students at Worcester State, what is some advice that you would give to them, like just getting started? Getting started, um, I know not everyone wants to hear this, but I think with getting started, I, I'd say do as many things as you can, that you can do well, that is. I wouldn't say overwhelm yourself, but when I, was, uh, when I was younger and doing whatever I could, the best experiences I got were often by accident, right? Just because I said yes to various things, holding the boom mic for one production here or doing the slate for a production there, whatever it might be, right? Just simple tasks right. that maybe other people might not find as glorious. It actually, it helps you learn how other people work. You pick up tricks of the trade that you might not have otherwise, especially in an academic setting, right? You can learn so much in college, but so much more you're gonna learn just by working and doing random things, right? So again, without 
saying yes to everything. You don't want to be a yes man, but you do want to try and do as many things as possible and, and stay humble about it, right? Learn as many things as you can, because then when you are in a position doing exactly what you want to do, say it's directing or f composing or acting or whatever it is, when you're doing the thing you want to do, you'll actually be able to do it better because you understand how all the other parts work as well. So my big, best advice there is do as many different things as you can in the beginning. Yeah, ab absolutely. Just getting one foot in front of the other and yeah. just becoming. And you meet people too. The yeah, networking exactly. is probably the best part. That's one of the reasons I do filmmaking, is I like the camaraderie and the, the, the familial aspect of it, where people get together, they, they create something together, and they, you know, they have a good time doing it. Right? It's less work. You know? Yeah, I can imagine the amount of time that you're spending with those people is definitely, 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 definitely. family esque. Um, well, that's the goal. I'd like to, again, I've been working on short films, uh, so those, are those sets are usually a lot shorter, maybe a weekend or oh, a week really? at a time. Right, right, right. Um, but, the, you know, the goal is eventually get to, is to get to the feature length film, and there you're right, yeah, there you hopefully have that atmosphere, right? For sure, definitely. Okay, I'm going to take a little bit of a turn here. I've heard For that sure. you have a, a basketball background. A basketball of. background, yes. Uh, is it true you're a referee? Is that is there I am a referee. I'm a licensed ref referee in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, really? It's a good it's a good gig if you like uh, getting yelled at while you do your job. So, of course. Uh, thankfully, I have a pretty level head about me, so uh, I'm pretty good at it. I'm actually oftentimes told I don't uh, talk back enough or give enough technical fouls out. Um, but yes, I'm a basketball referee. It's one of my ways to stay in with the game. It's one of my passions. I know I might not look it. I'm a, not the tallest person in the world, but hey. but no, Hard I played overnight. I played when I was younger. I've I've continued to play in my in my 30s now, and I think uh, refereeing was a way for me to not just stay with the game, but also understand it better. So you learn a lot of things when you try, similar to what I was just saying with uh, filmmaking, when you do things that maybe you had never considered before, you learn a lot more about that thing, of course. And refereeing has really changed how I view the game and has actually made me want to get into coaching more, which I haven't done yet, although I did just recently guest coach for the Wor Worcester State women's basketball team, which was really? a fun experience. That's um, we lost, but it was good. Um, and uh, so yes, basketball is a passion. I referee currently, but I've been playing since I was maybe uh, nine or ten. So, really, what level do you do you referee at? I referee every level except college and professional. So I can do high school, middle school, JV, travel oh, wow. league, anything. Yep, so okay, that that is cool. That is cool. I've, I'm a basketball player myself. So what, what position? Hard over height, like we were saying. Oh, so, there you, know, you five, go. Five there nine, go. Uh, undersized, low point. You got guard, a three-point so. shot or no? It's a work in progress. I was you know? a three and D guy. That's why I ask. So yeah, defense is not there yet, but you know I'm I'm in the lab working on it. So you always gotta get to keep we, working. Yeah, we will see how that goes. So after this, we're gonna go. go yeah, hoop. yeah. No, that's the one for Did sure. Pick up. Yeah, let's run it. Ninety four right, feet. I'll back. pick you up. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Full court. <laughs> that's the one. Um, okay. So you teach documentary production or media writing, all of that. So do you do any writing of yourself, or is that just? Not journal. I mean, I teach a lot of journalistic writing. I don't really do journalism per se, although I've dabbled a little bit in sports writing. Currently, the writing I'm doing, I mentioned Periphery, the short film that I helped right, right. co-write. Of course. Uh, but I am doing a little bit of script writing with my sister-in-law. Her name is Chudiman, uh, and she lives in Thailand. And she's uh, she's actually a fairly well-known script writer in Thailand. And she's actually asked me to work on a project with her where. Um, we have a, don't have a working title yet, but it's supposed to center around the martial art of Muay Thai. Uh, and we are writing um, a television series. Oh, wow. And what's interesting about that is she wants me to focus on the American release while she focuses on the Thai release. So it's going to be released in two different countries. We actually already have a director slated for it, which is really cool. Uh, and so it's really interesting working with her in the sense that I have to, I don't speak Thai. Uh, and so sh she has to translate for me the ideas she comes up with, and then I have to sort of not only use the translation, but also adjust it for a Western audience, right? Because not everything, right. not every trope or joke or uh, thing that you say in one language is going to translate to another, right. right? And vice versa, of right? Course. And so it's a very interesting project in that regard because it's multilingual, right? Right. Okay. So I mean, that must be an, an insane process within itself. Do you know, very, like very much so. when when that will be kind of. Oh, that's in the pre-production phase, right. so uh, by a long shot. So that won't be released. That we're probably going to start production next year at the earliest, and so right. you probably wouldn't see that until another couple years from now. But again, that's the name of the game. Sometimes you have to have a lot of foresight in this kind of business, right? Right. And right. be able to look many months and the, years ahead of time. The so. timeline for sure. And sometimes things are behind. I'm currently also working on a, a mini mini series, a seven part mini t uh, television series, which is probably just going to be released straight to YouTube, but um, which is. Uh, I have a lot of footage that I took over my time during the pandemic because mm. I was isolated by myself in England, England for most of that time for about two years. And, 
and so I have all this footage and I want to edit it together and tell a story with that, even though I shot that footage without any kind of direction or idea of what I was going to do with it. Um, so again, that's another, sometimes you think way ahead in the future and sometimes you put things off because you already have most of it and it's just not the right time to do it or edit it or whatever the case may be, right? So again, you have to be flexible. Just having those things in your back, back pocket for sure. I right, guess can uh, be a, exactly. can be a, a, a huge pro. And I know we were talking previously about sports, so do you have anything to do with like sports media or anything of that nature? I do, uh, well, I do a lot with sports as we've talked about, course, refereeing yeah. and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things I love doing is sports photography. It's um, Again, I'm more of a video person, but right. when it comes to photographing people in motion, there's something about that. One of my, in most of my films, I usually have some sort of slow motion feature mm. or something like that. I'm obsessed with slowing things down and showing details of things, but it's the same with sports photography. It's not video, but being able to capture a moment, especially when things are moving fast or maybe something you're highlighting something that maybe other people wouldn't have seen in a game. It's, it's really fascinating. And so I'm actually the, the team photographer for the Worcester Warriors, which is a, a local team here in Worcester. And they, um, they're part of a, a semi-professional league uh, that operates without, within the New England or the Northeast region of America. Uh, and so, and the, they're a fun team to, to cover. They, I'm sort of one of the guys now because I've been doing it for a couple seasons. Uh, so the, I don't even need credentials and things like that anymore, oh, really? which, is f which is fun. So that's one of, one of my favorite things to do is I, I'll go to their games and I'll photograph with them. I'll go into the, into the locker room at halftime and after the game. They recently suffered through a, a winless season, oh, which no, was pretty terrible. Fun. Those, those are, are not fun, fun whatsoever. But, um, but one, of the, they were, uh, one of the more rewarding things for me was they told me that despite, you know, they didn't win a single game that season, but a lot of people were grateful that they at least had, you know, pictures of their work, right? Because, again, when you're not playing... Uh, you know, an MLS or a super professional sport, you don't always have people there to document the work that you do, right? And so they were they were very grateful of that, which was which was very rewarding for me. So, so Worcester Warriors, that's a football team or uh, soccer? Soccer team, right. okay. I say football because I'm I'm Austrian. So. No, that that makes sense. Right. That makes sense. So, a little bit of confusion. A little here confusion. Once, yes. Once in a while. Soccer team, yes. Um. So yeah, no, I mean going into sport. the sport. For sure, and uh, going into you know having a, lo a losing season, New England's not used to many of those. Yeah, so. Definitely. Well, we're about to be. So. Hey, I mean. You never know. Uh, hopefully not. Yeah, hopefully stay optimistic. Not, hopefully not, for sure. Uh, but you know, seeing the work that goes into that uh, being encapsulated, they can see that during the good times, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what else do you have coming up next? I know you mentioned a little bit of your touring. You might want to get into coaching. If there's like an order of kind of. Oh, an order of operations. I think so next, so the biggest thing for me is, of course, we've got the semester. Of so course. for me, I have the summer off, well, Absolutely. off technically. Yeah. I do other projects in the summer. but. Um, uh, you know, got, got to get through the semester, but I'm working on uh, finishing Periphery, which is the short mm, film the I'm short working film. on with Brittany Severance. And uh, so we're trying to wrap that up. We're working on getting a composer for that currently, and then we're going to submit it to festivals, which is very exciting. Uh, I think the other thing is um, maybe turning that piece, depending on the reception of it, into a feature, right? So again, that's a much different process, right? right? And it's a much longer process. So in, in terms of what's next, I think that's one of the things I would like to take on film career-wise. In terms of refereeing, I'm, I'm happy where, with where I'm at. I'm going to stick to those levels for now. Maybe in two or three years, I'd try to move up to maybe uh, you know college level or something like that. But I think I'm at a good place with that right now. Uh, and then in terms of uh, music career, I'm happy with where I'm at there as well right now. I'm just, I do it more on the amateur side of things. So for example, the tour I'm on, I'm not yeah. a, a solo singer or anything. I'm just big, a part of a choir, which is how I like it. Again, I do a lot of things that are similar in nature in terms of like being part of a bigger group, a lot Absolutely. of camaraderie, a lot of fun, travel. That yeah. kind of thing, right? So that's that's really what's next is maybe working on a feature and submitting to festivals and getting the getting the pieces I have been working on out there, finished and out there. So no, that makes sense for sure. The team aspect of things is always always a blast. Uh, okay, so yeah, I want to thank you for the time. I mean, I really appreciate that. Of course. Um, Anytime. Again, uh, this is Tristan Kumi. I'm here with uh, with with Herman Servatius, professor, Worcester State University. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Find us on socials, and thank you. Bye. <laughs>